Hi family and welcome back to Wisdom for Life. My name is Brittany and I'm so glad to be joining you this morning. We're taking a look at the study, What is the New Normal? We never expected that we wouldn't be allowed to shake each other's hands. We never expected that we wouldn't be allowed to greet or hug or even meet in buildings together. But is that the new normal? No, God's word is our normal. We need to stir up our faith in His Word so that we can overcome the fear that the world is trying to throw in our faces. His Word is our final authority. So let's continue the study and stir up our faith together. Uh, what is the new normal? And I've heard it even on newscasts and that they say, this is the new normal. Now, family of God, we recognize that there are some changes that have taken place. Some of them are for the worse. Because when people are in lockdown, they land up in isolation. And in isolation, we become very self-centered. And when we become self-centered, and the enemy, if you're not redeemed and you don't know how to deal with that, the enemy can get a hold of a person in their carnal nature and turn that self-centeredness into hatred for anything else. And that's what prejudice is. Prejudice is nothing more than a demonic spirit of division. It comes in so many different ways. I know that in South Africa we face racism as a major issue. And well, many nations do. We, we know that it's true. And, and the reason why I say many nations, I'm, I'm saying in South Africa because it seems to be more prevalent here because we see it firsthand. But racism can exist even between people that are not of the same skin color. You know, if you think in terms of uh, in, in, in Russia and those areas, uh, there is racism between their various countries and, and so, based on social aspects. Why? Because it's the same demonic spirit. It's the same demonic spirit. And how that demonic spirit works is that it will get us, me, if it's working in my life, will get me to think that I, for whatever reason I think I am, isn't it amazing how we always think that we are generally the right person? An argument is nothing more than a reason the argument is because you've got two people who both think they're right. It's the only reason you have an argument. Isn't that right? So we always look at ourselves and don't people understand me and don't people see who I am and can't they see what I think and why don't they think the way I think. And so what the devil will do is he'll highlight someone who's different and then get us to believe that our way is superior. And the moment you have that, there's a prejudice. And that's something you and I are dealing with all the time. And so that's why when you look at during the period of lockdown, we're not exposed to other people. And then you find that people become less and less and less tolerant. And that's where we saw so much violence and anger erupt towards the end of the lockdown. And so that's why I'm saying all of that is because we've seen some change in the world where we've lost years of traction, where there's been improvements and all of a sudden seems to be Rewinding to old hatred days around things like that. And we, as the church, need to stay consistent in who we are in keeping up high the standards of God's kingdom. Say amen. We are the ones who have to establish what is righteousness. The world needs the answer. And I've said it so many times before, politics has not found the answer. Science has not yet solved every disease. I mean, that's just been proved in the last few months. If it was not for Jesus, how many more people would have died? But because of his word and his life, many, many, many people were healed in the name of Jesus. The news doesn't talk about that. They highlight all the deaths. But how many people were healed because, uh, they, you know, because of the name of Jesus? We got many, many testimonies that came in. Uh, Political science hasn't yet solved our governmental issues. Uh, they're looking all the time for better solutions. That's why laws are changed and repealed. Because there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is death. And so we make a law, and we go, ooh, that didn't work. And we change the law, ooh, that didn't work. We change the law, ooh, that didn't work. And we just get, and that, it's just blind people trying to lead blind. And yet the Word of God, the Bible tells us very clearly, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so a lot of change was for the worse. But some of the change is for the good. 
some of the things that you see happening, what has been highlighted in your life? What, is the, what, is you, or what have you changed in your life? And here again, we have to keep saying, when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, uh, many churches that were never online were forced to go online. I knew churches that would openly speak against social media. I've, I've always said, the devil has never invented anything. If anything exists that came from the mind of God, Satan perverts it. And because he perverts it, doesn't mean I, as the church, give up on it. Church says, no, oh, that's evil, we're not going to use it. No, I'll take it back, baptize it, clean it up, and use it. Are you getting what I'm saying? And so, when the television, I mean, they were back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, they spoke about it being the eye of the devil. Because evil was coming through the television. But, we got a hold of it, we redeemed it, cleaned it up, put the gospel on it, and now people are getting the word that they never got before. So, the same with online is that now we're able to reach more people than we've never been able to reach before. But online doesn't replace the church. Come on, say amen. amen. I know it's comfortable when you're sitting at home and you just slip out of bed, grab a cup of coffee, snuggle up and just watch some TV. We're not watching TV. We are the church that engages. And we're not going to neglect the gathering of the saints. Can I get a bigger amen? amen. And so we're going to keep pursuing what God wants. So what the, the time away has done is highlighted a lot of things in our lives. Things we took for granted. Things that we didn't realize we actually needed. Even in the, uh, the other aspects, things that we never even realized were idols. If I asked you eight months ago, do you have any idols in your life? You would have said, no. Come on. Uh, you can say amen. I can't see you through your, through your mask. So you can say Amen. And how many of you can admit there were things that you thought, without realizing it, you put trust in and faith in, you leaned on, and suddenly it wasn't there, and you realized, ooh, I actually can't put trust in that anymore, because it's not there right now. My source has to still be God. Because we say, yes, we trust God, but as long as that's there. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, that's not there anymore. Oh, do we still trust God? Is my amen still as loud as it was before? That there wasn't there anymore. Come on, how many you can admit to that? Just wave your hand if you can say you agree with that. And so if we're going to say the new normal, what are we talking about? And so we said, well, if we're going to look at the new normal, what is normal for God? In Genesis chapter 1, once again, God had created man and he said in verse 28, God blessed man and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose he fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Say this, God gave me seed for all my provision. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is the very first words that God God, that creation hears from God. God is the Word. His whole kingdom is Word-based. Everything He does is through words. He upholds all things by the Word of His power. So creation has been uh, all of God's existence, eternity, angels, everything that's been existing in all eternity have operated under God's spoken Word. Now is the first time that God has released that into a nat natural creation, where you see a, what we call a natural manifestation. And then he creates man and puts him into that, and then invokes this blessing, and he releases his eternal plan, is for mankind to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, and to subdue it and take dominion. In other words, when God said, let us create man in our image, we are to live just as God lives. When God created man, it was for man to live as his children, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Even Adam was called the Son of God. He was the first Adam. Jesus came as the last Adam, as the Son of God, to demonstrate how a Son of God should live. And then died and rose from the dead so that each and every one of us could become 
sons of God. Come on, say hallelujah. And so that was God's original plan. Has it changed? Well, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, how many of you were with us last week? Can I just see your hand? Do you remember I gave you an assignment? I said, do yourselves a favor. Go to bed last week, Sunday night. Wake up in the morning and go read that verse again. Do you remember me giving that? I won't ask you to put your hand up because I don't want to. I wonder how many people did go read it. But did you notice now a week later, today is still today. I said today is still today. Jesus is the same yesterday, last Sunday when it was today. But then when you woke up this morning, you renamed today, today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. When it arrives, you will rename it today. This verse will update itself every single day. Why? Because Jesus is eternal. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, family of God, understand this. You know I don't say anything superfluously. Sometimes people look at me and say, yes, I know that. I've read that verse. I can quote that verse. I understand what you're saying. The reason I'm saying it over and over again, because I want you to stop for a moment and just meditate on that concept instead of just glibly going of the verse. I know what it's like for myself when I read the Bible. Very often I'm reading, you know, you read for different reasons. You're either reading because reading you're looking up something you want to know, so you know it's in a specific place. So you may read to go find where it is. You might need to read a bit to find out exactly where it is. Secondly, you may read just out of devotion. You want to read God's word and let it feed your spirit. Third, you may be reading it to prepare for a message, to teach or help somebody. You know, another reason you may want to read it is because, uh, you, you know, it's good to fill the heart with faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Other times you just want to know about the story. Go and read the historical aspect. So you read with different purposes. And depending what those are, you know, you may be reading and scanning and whatever. I found myself sometimes as you read, you get to familiar portions of scripture because you want to save time. You know what that says. So you skip. Oh, come on. Am I the only one? Has anyone ever experienced that? There's nothing wrong with that. If, if I want to find out, you know, something about David and I know the particular event was, yeah, then I'll scan. Fine, I'm looking, I'm looking. But if you're reading and all of a sudden, oh, I know that, and boom, you know, be cautious with that. Because I did that once and the Spirit stopped me and He said, go back and read that again. And I forced myself, even though I knew the words, word for word, can quote it word for word, taught from it many, 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 many times, I went and read it in detail, and God's word spoke to me again. So I just want to give that as an encouragement, as you study the word of God. And I want to do that right now with this verse. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're never going to catch Jesus ever, ever, ever saying, I don't know why I said that. I don't know what I was thinking. Or will he say, no, God, listen, that was for the 20th century. That's not for today. No, everything that God says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This Bible didn't come into existence the first time man wrote it. This word has been established before God ever said, light be. And I want you to get a hold of that. Because when you read the book, don't look at it as an old manuscript. Look at it as a futuristic, <laughs> something that's come from another dimension, the realm of the spirit. And it is more up to date than the newspaper that was printed this morning. It's more up to date than anything man could ever come up with. And so family of God, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then we're going to take his word as the foundation of our lives. How many say amen to that? And so we just went through, 
you know, the whole of the Old Testament last week, we saw that Adam had disobeyed, and a result of that is that sin had entered into the world, then there was that flood, then we saw Noah come uh, off the ark after the flood, and the very first thing God does in Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. A flood did not change the plan. The fact that man sinned did not change the plan. Say amen. And then we saw in Genesis chapter 12 how God showed up to Abram. And in chapter 17, the first time he announces himself as El Shaddai. El Shaddai. I am God Almighty is how you read it in the new translations in English. The Hebrew is El Shaddai. The word El Shaddai, you know, it means in, in its loose translation, the self-sufficient one. Again, meditate on that. God has said in His Word, if I was hungry, I would not tell you. Now, how do you know God will never be hungry? But what He's saying is, if I have need of anything, I'm not going to get it from you. He is the self-sufficient one. Everything is in God. God has need of nothing. I said, God has need of nothing. God, oh, <laughs> listen to what I'm saying. If God has need of nothing, then why did He create you? God loves so much that the God that has need of nothing, He has no need of food, he has no need of accommodation, he has no need of finances, whatever he wants, he speaks and he has it. Whatever he imagines needs to exist, he just says it and there it is. He needs no one for anything. He needs nothing. And yet he creates you. Why? Because out of his love, he wants someone else to experience what he experiences. He wants somebody else to know what it's like to not need anything but him. He is your source. He is your life. He is your provider. He is the one that looks after, protects, and makes sure you have everything you need. Shout hallelujah. And so God's desire is to see that continue. And so he comes and he speaks to Abraham and says, I am that all-sufficient one. I have absolutely need of nothing. And then he says to him, and I will make my covenant between me and you and multiply you exceedingly and then verse 6 I'll make you exceedingly fruitful and make nations of you and kings shall come from you and I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you family of God the plan has not changed and then we saw in Malachi chapter 3 Verse 18, he talks about all the people that are moaning about why God hasn't blessed them. And he said, hang on now, I've chosen you. He says in verse 18, you will again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. Family of God, we are the church and we are to demonstrate to this world what it means to be a believer. And if we want to know what that means, we better find out what the Word of God says about it. Not all dead traditional religious practices. You know, if, it, if we think what it means to be the church is just simply meet in a building, we've missed it. Because a lot of people try that and then they don't want to come back. Why? Because of, for whatever reason. But we as the church need to demonstrate what is God's original plan. To be fruitful, to multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. We want to manifest what God thinks that looks like so that it can be a testimony to the world of who God really is. 
not your and my makeup of what he is. And that's all that really religion is, dead religion, is man's opinion of what they think God should be and then trying to force other people by rules and rituals to maintain that thought. No, we want to go back to what God said. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. That was the last word that they had heard 400 years ago, and they've been waiting, and now John arrives, and the first thing you hear, after 400 years, Years of silence from heaven, the plan didn't change. God had that, he shot that arrow and he waited for 400 years for the right moment to be in place. And when the right moment arrived, went straight into action exactly as he had said it 400 years before. I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, who is this? Look at verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Teaching a preaching a baptism of, everybody say repentance. For what reason? The remission of sins. One of the things that I've been hearing floating around is, Pastor Allen, what's the new normal? In a world that has been turned upside down with the threat of wars, pandemics, racism and calamities. Family God, God created man to have dominion over creation, not for creation to dictate to man what he must do. In this series, Alan Bay delves into the promises in God's Word, reminding us of the unchanging, all-powerful, ever-present God we serve. If you want to talk about normal, this book is the normal. He helps build our faith to stay focused on God in these unsure times. The very first word, creation years, is be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. Visit us online or make use of any of these details, but get hold of your series and strengthen your faith to see God's power working in and through your life. This series truly is one of my favorites that Dad has taught recently. With the way things have been in the world, it's so easy to believe that that is the new normal. But I've noticed that leaning on the Word of God is our normal. It's how we've experienced these victories and promises coming to pass in our lives. I want to encourage you to get your hands on a copy for yourself so that you can continue the study in your own time. You can contact us at the details below. It truly is a powerful tool. Now, my friend, the first step to this normal that my dad's been talking about is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you haven't yet accepted him, I want to pray this prayer with you. So let's close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I believe he died and rose again. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. You are now my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And congratulations, my friend. I'm so excited that you've prayed this prayer. If this was your first time praying this prayer, won't you let us know? You can contact us at the details below. My dad has a free gift he'd like to get into your hand. It's just some tools to walk you through this new journey. We are so excited for you. Congratulations. Well, family, that's all we have time for today. 
join us again tomorrow as we continue the powerful study on what is the new normal. My name is Brittany, reminding you that Jesus is Lord. Life is a choice. Choose life. With a call to equip believers to flourish in their ministries, Alan and Janine Bank are the senior pastors of the Bay Christian Family Church, one church in many locations. Many locations, one church, one vision. It is one church, multiple locations. Alan and Janine Bag invite you to join us this weekend at the Bay Christian Family Church for some great times of worship in God's amazing presence, for faith-building messages from God's uncompromised Word, and for some great times of fellowship with the family of God. People connecting with people. Wherever you're able to, join the family at the Bay Christian Family Church this weekend for amazing times in God's presence and faith-building times in God's life-changing Word. If you're not close to any of our locations, feel free to participate in our online services over the weekend at allenbagministries.org. For any information relating to the Bay Christian Family Church, our contact details or our locations, please visit us online at allenbagministries.org. Alan Bag Ministries is making the series that featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs available to you for purchase. If you missed any of this week's programs or if this week's Wisdom for Life programs have helped you, we encourage you to purchase the series featured on this week's Wisdom for Life programs and have them available to strengthen your faith when needed. The series featured as this week's Wisdom for Life programs is available in digital format. So purchase yours online at allenbagministries.org or contact us to order your series at any of these details.